there is a fifth dimension beyond that which is known to man. It is a dimension as vast as space and as timeless as infinity. It is the middle ground between light and shadow, between science and superstition, and it lies between the pit of man's fears and the summit of his knowledge. This is the dimension of imagination. It is an area which we call the Twilight Zone. Hello and welcome to a new episode of the Twilight Highlight Zone. I'm Ben Hansen, joined by... Wait a minute. What's your name again? Uh, it's Jeff. Oh! Uh, we're here to talk about the second, I believe, second to last episode of the Twilight Zone reboot on and CBS Ultimate. All Access. Yeah, hell yeah. This is called The Blue Scorpion. Yes. Jeff, you were excited for this one because you watched the teaser for last for this episode and last week's yeah. episode. What excited you about this premise? Or it looked you, interesting and cool. What did they convey in the teaser? There was a gun. <laughs> Finally, some storytelling. Exactly. Uh, did they talk about the Jeff thing at all, or is that... No. Oh, that's very fun. What a fun Easter egg for someone with the same name. Do you feel like that impacted your enjoyment of the episode? Uh, No. Great. Well, here we go. Let's talk about the Blue Scorpion. The Blue Scorpion, or as I like to call it, being Jeff Malkovich. Ta-da! The end. Thanks for watching. <laughs> oh, my gosh. All right. Are you ready for this recap? Yeah. Okay. So, Chris O'Dowd. From the IT crowd, as you... Bridesmaids. You may remember him best from his iconic role in Thor 2 The Dark World. Mm-hmm. He plays Jeff Mingus Stork, who is a professor of anthropology. All right, here we go. So at the very beginning, Jeff is in his dad's house talking to his estranged wife on the phone saying, I gave you space, and I moved out, we got couples therapy. Suddenly, he calls out to his dad, there's no answer, and he sees his dad's body. His father has shot himself, so he calls the cops, and he says, my dad's name is Otis Stork, and then we see on the floor a casing of a bullet. Does he see the bullet, or does no! the camera just see the, the bullet? the camera just sees it. There's the name Otis, as he's saying, my dad's name is Otis Stork. And then you see the the casing with the name Otis on it in all caps. Well, I like when the cop is there then, and he's like, ah, we no need to. He said, we always investigate, but like, we all know what this is. Yeah, here. we know what this is. Yeah, no Twilight Zone episode buried here, sir. Please carry on your Yeah, way. this is a cut and drag case. Yes, but nay. No, no. The detective guy asks, hey, is this your dad's gun? And he's like, oh, my dad was a lifelong hippie. And then there's this weird exchange where... Uh, Jeff kind of snaps at the detective saying, can we do this later? Because my dad basically shot himself in front of me and the cop cracks him and is like, well, actually it would have been last night. And Jeff starts freaking out saying, basically means basically, not absolutely, basically. That, this set off a tone for the episode of like, what is going on here? Because yeah. a couple times throughout the course of the episode, they'll go for like these little comedic moments, just kind of like fumbling or mm -hmm. stumbling. And that was the first one where it's like, is this just designed to be funny or is it designed to convey that he is a little bit more unstable than we think like, yeah. what, did you, what did you make of that i i was like again it was like is this jeff guy kind of a dick is that what's going on here yeah unclear <laughs> even after having watched the entire yeah. episode yeah so and then the then the the detective was like oh he left a note incidentally i'll let you read it and the note says well i also the cop says i could read it to you doesn't he yeah <laughs> Which is like well, that's a very uncomfortable i'll offer. do a voice uh, he says, the note says, I love him more than you, which immediately my pronoun detector went off. Yeah, pronoun trouble. Exactly. So then the narrator pops in and he's sitting in an armchair in Dan's house. Uh, maybe, maybe we could do, I'm thinking for the next episode, which is the last episode, we should rank the narrator Jordan Peele's appearances. Oh my God. Shut up. What we need to do, I don't think we've talked about it once, is we need to have a Franklin's episode. Yeah. For season one of the reboot. Right. And that sounds like a good category yeah. for the Franklins. And maybe like best prop that the narrator has been holding. Mm, okay. He seems like he's really into like just touching things and yeah. grabbing stuff. If you have categories you want us to cover in the Franklins, uh, you can leave them in the comments below if you're watching on YouTube. Otherwise, you can tweet at me at uh, Yozetti, Y-O-Z-E-T-T-Y. -T -T yeah. I would love suggestions for Franklins episodes yeah. or categories. Yeah, absolutely. So now we're on the beach. And Jeff is giving a eulogy to his dad, and it's basically a baby boomer's wet dream. 
He, his dad was a jazz musician. He jammed with the Grateful Dead, and he evaded the Vietnam draft with Neil Young and Crazy Horse. And he played in Cuba with Billy Joel. Mike, that, I, well, that, real quick. Huh? Why? Why what? Storytelling-wise, why this thread? Uh, because they had 45 minutes to fill instead of... <laughs> Half an hour. Like, there's one little cutesy Easter egg that we'll get to later. That's uh, like maybe yeah. that's why. But they just needed his dad to have some possession for the story later on. But that was one of those right. things. I'm like, is this going to come back in a big way? I think they were trying to show too that like, oh, this is a person who wouldn't have liked guns. I guess you're right. I guess you're right. In that's, a way, you're right. But, All right, it seems kind of weird. But then he also says like, then he went to Ireland and uh, he found uh, Chris O'Dowd's mom and took them and uh, and the character of Jeff his accent to America. And yeah. then it seems like a good life. Jeff doesn't understand why his dad offed himself. And then he's like, did it not turn out as he wanted? Yeah, he was, was loved. He, was he loved. never went unloved, he says. Yeah. Also credits during this sequence, right? Uh, revealing that it was written by Glenn Morgan. Hmm. As we all know, Mr. Morgan's work. He wrote the Final Destination series. Oh, interesting. And a lot of X-Files episode uh-huh. and Willard. Willard. And the director, Craig William McNeil, uh, mm-hmm. He directed a movie called The Boy, I don't think I'd heard of, uh, and like an episode of like the new Sabrina. Hmm. Not as much under his belt from what I can tell, but yeah. there we go. Interesting. Now, back at the house, Jeff is wearing a tie-dyed t-shirt, and it's uh, got a heart on it. Mm-hmm. And he's going through his dad's stuff, and he finds in the closet there's a sh- uh, safe, and inside that is a heart-shaped box, and inside of that is an ornate magazine for a handgun, and inside of it is a bullet with... Jeff written on it. Good God. Good God. What could this mean? And correct me if I'm wrong, the box always has a light in it, right? No. The box has holes drilled into the... Oh, okay. Which we'll get into that in a little bit. Gotcha. Uh, so now he's on campus, and he suddenly realizes, which all Jeffs have realized this at some point in our lives, uh, that you can't escape the name Jeff. It is just ubiquitous. So he's hearing everyone saying Jeff. This girl says on the phone, he's such a Jeff. I also wrote that one down. A and guy then, has a jersey that says Jeff on it. Yeah, this guy calls his dog, hey, Jeff. <laughs> You're like, what? That was one of those things like, oh, he's cracking. But by the end of the episode, I mean, maybe it's debatable, but it's like, I guess he wasn't cracking. No, there really a lot, was. There's a lot of Jeffs. A lot of Jeffs. And it, I think it's supposed to immediately be like a, sh- a pardon me, else, like a shotgun blast of like, hey, there's a lot of Jeffs. You don't know which one this bullet could be meant for. Which I think is a pretty fun conceit for the episode right yeah. of like the mind game of which jeff is this for oh yeah. it turns out there's almost a jeff in every scene good luck whose gun is it anyway so back at his old house he goes through the mail his ex-wife he's like he kind of lurking around he, he goes into his old house his wife pulls a gd gun on him yeah she's like get out of my house he's gonna him and then like apparently she's kind of freaked out because uh first uh her ex-husband is <laughs> rummaging around in the in the house, uh-huh. and she's like, "There's been some home invasions in the neighborhood." Uh, she's like, the cops came by and dropped something off, and it is the gun. And she's like, "Yeah, it's probably worth something at the very least." And uh, Jeff says, "I'm not going to make money off my dad's death." And then they kind of get into a big fight about divorce attorney, and then she reveals she's in love with another man named Jeff. Jeff. All right, so Jeff is. Back at his dad's house, and he opens the box, and it's an ornate handgun, and it's got a blue scorpion inlaid on the on the grip, and it looks rad as f- I mean, it's a pretty cool looking, cool looking gun. Oh, you like it? Yeah, I think it looks cool. Hmm. So he goes to load the magazine, and then he drops it. Right, guns. What are you gonna do? But it's like it's a very another kind of comedic moment, right, where the music is mm-hmm. really building up, tensions yeah. building, and then oh, 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 oh butterfingers. Uh, exactly. Then he looks at the suicide note and he wonders aloud, am I him or am I you? Interesting thought. Very interesting. So then he calls a Hang website. On, stop. I need help oh, okay. with this. Okay. I need help with this. Yeah. When you say your pronoun brain was, was throbbing yeah. or however you put it. Yeah. What, what did you mean by that? When you, when you saw I love him more than you, let's really try to break this down. What were you thinking? Oh, I was thinking this is not, he's not writing this like. Otis didn't write it? No, no, no. Otis wrote it, but I think that. The him was not who you're meant to believe who it is. Like, it seems like a kind of an ambiguous, like, well, who's he, like, it's easy to. Uh, and first, over. I was like, oh, brother or something, right? Like, I love him more than you. And I think on first read, Jeff would think he's the you. Mm-hmm. But here in that moment, he says, you know, 
Am I him or am I you? Yeah. Yeah. It's beautiful. But I think the fact that it didn't call out specifically, hey, Jeff, sorry. I'm not into this stuff anymore. Right. Also, I'm not I, much of a writer. I'm exactly. going to keep this pretty brief. Yeah. Blue Scorpion is calling. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, uh, Jeff calls a website to... Uh, calls a website. It's very strange, which I'll get, to, get into that in a second. He to sell the gun. And he reads off the serial number and the guy on the phone is immediately super excited. It's the Blue Scorpion! He thought it was just a Cuban myth. Apparently it's worth $25,000, $50,000 and legend is it finds you, not the other way around. And Che Guevara was looking for it. Yeah! Jeff says, I want it out of here! And then suddenly the gun goes off by itself, which I thought was pretty cool. I, and it's, it's, there's a couple smart things. Mm -hmm. Like the easy thing of, you know, everybody's named Jeff, so the target yeah. could be anybody. Also, just early in the episode, the gun goes off randomly once. It adds such a beautiful amount of tension to that entire episode. Oh, for sure. I think it's a super smart, simple, weird move. Yeah. And the gun, the guy on the phone is just like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Did you have a, did you have a gun in the chamber, uh, bullet in the chamber? And then he's like, okay, we're getting back to business. <laughs> you know, if you don't have a license, you gotta, you gotta ship it by a carrier, but uh, be sure to punch a hole in the box because the gun is afraid of the dark. He, that's certainly a thing. Yeah. And then he said that his name is Bob Jeff, <laughs> which I had reminded <laughs> several Jeff. times yeah. to be like, because at first I thought he said another name mm -hmm. and that Jeff was hearing Jeff when there was yeah. no Jeff, but there was a Jeff. It was just a quick Bob Jeff. Bob Jeff. Yeah. It, it seems like our Jeff made the right call by contacting gunsuperstore.com because that guy is apparently well-versed in legends. Yeah, exactly. I just, yeah, could I call any store where they know one legend about what field Yeah, you in? punch in the serial number and immediately like a whole paragraph about, okay, Shane Gravana. Yeah. It finds you and I hear a punch a hole. It's afraid of the dark. <laughs> <laughs> Very interesting. It's worth twenty-five to $50,000. Uh -huh. uh, th th then all this Jeff talk got me thinking, like when I was in elementary school, there was another kid named Jeff in my class and I have a distinct memory of washing my hands in the bathroom and he was there washing his hands too and he said that he had never met an adult named jeff and then he thought jeff was a dumb name and wow. that stuck with me like yeah i never met an adult named jeff either and now here i am you've met yourself man i've met myself anyway i love him more than you so we're in jeff's office he's back at school because as you remember he's a, a professor of anthropology and a student is talking about a research project about animism in contemporary china she starts going off about how objects have souls which is perfect timing for this episode of the show <laughs> it's messing with her head she says she's starting to believe it then she's like uh her name's not jeff but the gun superstore calls and she's kind of freaking out about not being able to leave her apartment without making sure objects are grouped together so they don't get lonely and she also leaves the lights on because she's a she thinks she's that the objects are afraid of the dark, and uh, then finally he's just like, ah, he's like, you're thinking it's called anthropomorphism, whatever. But it's kind of funny for her, like writing this thesis for this mm -hmm. big paper on this topic, and she's like going into the office, and it's like that weird basic discussion is if you're like a graduate level student mm -hmm. on climate change, and it's like, well, you know how weather's different from climate. Yeah, <laughs> it's like it's just like the base level, like this is what you talk about with the professor. Yeah, and then. Yeah, so she's able to change her paper. Oh, yes, okay. Because she wanted to talk about something else because it this, was freaking her this out. This scene's freaking me out. Okay. Because why have him be the professor? Just to get this exposition in there of talking about anthropomorph anthropomorphism and mm -hmm. animism? Like, is that what's happening It seems like, what's a, a, happening like a good shortcut because otherwise what would it be? A, they're at the bar Whoa. and he's like, hey, what do you do? I'm a student. What do you study? Ah, I'm writing a paper about it animism in contemporary china that would have been weird so right? clearly that's important but then her storyline mm -hmm. is just oh by the way i'm also being tortured by inanimate objects <laughs> gotta go so it's yeah. just like it we'll get to this conclusion i think but this episode feels like it could go so many different places mm -hmm. and mean so many different things yeah. and ultimately i don't think it does no <laughs> and and this beat is another just one of those weird red herrings but then from jordan peele's closing narration it seems like oh no i guess this is the point is mm -hmm. that it is about America being obsessed with gadgets and gizmos and objects. Yeah. When I thought it was also just about the love of the father. It's just, what is this episode? And this is like a big beat. I'm just like, mm -hmm. what, 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 this scene. What are we doing we here? Need to slow down. What, what's happening? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Anyways. So then uh, Anne, his ex-wife, the attorney's waiting outside his office. His name is Jeff. Get out of town. Yeah. And he's then our Jeff is like, it's not a good time. My dad's dead. He didn't leave a will. And then and Jeff, the lawyer, his ears prick up. He's like, oh, well, in that case, half of everything belongs to Anne. 
And then gun guy calls again. He's like, Bob Jeff. And Jeff's like, stop calling. And then the guy's like, hey, this, the, there's a lot of interest in this thing. It's only had seven owners, Blue Scorpion, and then it's worth about $100,000. So big news for us. Mm-hmm. So now uh, Jeff is listening to White Rabbit, and he's high. And that was like, as you all know, that's one of the only songs that was ever recorded in the 1960s. Few people know that. And also, Cork, who wrote that song? Uh, it's Jefferson Air. Jefferson Airplane. Oh, no. That's intentional, right? Oh, it absolutely has to be. I didn't even think about that. But what's really, what really baked my noodle about this whole thing uh-huh. is Anne is played by Amy Landecker. Right. And I remember her most famously from A Serious Man, uh-huh. the Coen Brothers movie from yeah. 2009. It's also on Transparent. Oh, there we go. But... It's weird because Jefferson Airplane, like, somebody to love, is a big recurring thing in that movie. Hmm. So it's weird that, like, both Amy Landecker Mm -hmm. projects, Jefferson Airplane is a central theme here. Yeah, very interesting. So the song's playing. Oh, also, uh, fun fact, um, Amy Landecker is apparently in Doctor Strange, and so the the husband and wife are both technically in the Marvel Mm -hmm. Universe. All right. I'll give you a few seconds. (laughs) End conclusion. All right, and he, uh, Jeff's playing the bass along with it, and he, like, staggers over to the safe, takes out the blue scorpion, and then loads the magazine. And you're like, oh, and then he kind of comes to, then he puts the gun back in the safe, and the porch light snaps on. You're like, oh, what's going on here? Then he walks to his dad's room, and he sees the blue scorpion is on the bed. Good God. How'd that happen? And then, in the corner, in a completely pointless scene. Yeah, what is this? It's like the gun maker. And he's like, yeah, the blue scorpion loves you more than anyone. It only wants one thing in return, light. It's afraid of the dark. It's like, yeah, we knew that already. You just said that. like, <laughs> But the, he's so the, high. The gun guy knew that. Do you understand a greater importance to the whole scared of the dark thing? Other than, I guess, like the situation at the end? I think it's supposed to give you... To make it seem like this thing has thoughts... Okay. And fears and emotions. like Don't you think you get that from him saying that he has to get rid of it and it takes one shot? Doesn't that kind of cover, like, is this thing sentient or not? I think that this, it's like one step beyond that just okay. to really drive that home. Yeah. Yeah. So he goes to the gun shooting range. Guns to the gun range and he says, hey, I haven't shot this before, but I only, I only have to do it because I'm going to sell it. I got to shoot it once. And he starts rambling on about, I need to destroy a bullet. And he gives the bullet to the lady at the counter and she's looking at it and like, uh, okay. And then she if gets, I may, if I may pull a Jeff Cork, yeah, when he walks into the range, yeah, what's playing on the TV? Oh, I didn't see up on the top, yeah. it's playing a most unusual camera. Oh, very nice, also about a haunted object. I love it. Uh, and then the, 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 he's like, ah, it starts talking about it. everyone's named Jeff, and then she's like, hey, my co this guy right here, her co worker, he's named Jeff, yeah, and like, oh, good grief, yeah, I liked his line there. He said, to meet a different, uh, can you do an accent, accent, Chris, accent. Chris are down? No. He says, hey, to meet a different person named Jeff every single day, it's not right. <laughs> it's not right. I like that line a lot. It's just too many Jeff. <laughs> so he loads the mag, he puts the Jeff bullet in there and then loads up some more bullets and then shoots the target a bunch and he's an unbelievably shitty shot. He's, yeah. he's no good. And there's kind of a fun montage with music and he's, he's doing some clown stuff where he's like holding the gun sideways and all this other stuff. And then the music just abruptly stops as the gun jams. And he, he pulls it out, and it's like, it's just, it won't fire the Jeff bullet. Won't fire it. This one's for Jeff's only. This is where I think the episode takes a turn that I'm not able to track. Okay. Because he, like, falls in love with the gun mm-hmm. after this moment. Is yes. It, is it literally just as simple as he had a good time shooting that gun? I think it might be that, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I have a question. Yeah. Well, I think this could have been solved very easily. Why don't you just throw that bullet away? Because it would have like he would have woken up and it would have been in his mouth or something silly, you know. Yeah. Or like another bullet could have Jeff engraved on it. Right. Right. It seems like a very obvious. He didn't try to. Yeah. You want the scene of him chucking the bullet out to the water as the first move. Or literally doing anything to get rid of the bullet. Swallowing it. Yeah. Swallowing it. That's the solution. Do you think lead poison? Somebody during the course of this podcast playing in people's ears. Mm Hmm. Somebody on earth has swallowed a bullet. Not like, you know, a gangster. Are you talking like about swallow like, a bullet. Are you like, talking about like the bullet in the casing and everything? Like the whole yeah, thing? Just or swallowed just bullet. one bullet, yeah. I don't know. I bet they have. Really? Yeah. Okay. Hang on. Yeah, they have. They have. Oh, fascinating. 
So now Jeff, he's now he's in love with the gun. He kind of goes into his office. He's got a backpack on, and he like clears out his drawer and his desk, and puts the blue scorpion inside of it. And you're like, uh oh. But then he leaves a flashlight, which I think is a pretty cool touch because he can't drill <laughs> holes in the top of the desk. Don't be ridiculous. Uh, and then we immediately zoom to another office, and it's Jeff talking to his ex-wife and her attorney. He's got the backpack on the table. Chekhov's backpack. Hell yeah. Uh, the attorney's like, are you sure you want to go to the settlement without representation? And Jeff says, I'm at peace because I have a friend who's going to help me and make all of my troubles the disappear. Music's building. Music's building. He reaches in his backpack and pulls out his friend, a folder. And then she says, like, they kind of go back and forth over the belongings. And she's like, I want to take my, she wants to take the dad's base because it's worth a lot. And he freaks out and he says, I love her. She says she doesn't want to do it. Then he's like, he, he freaks out because it's kind of a Jeff thing to do. And he's escorted off the property. And says, you can have it all except for the blue scorpion. I loved him more than I loved you. Uh, he shouts. There it is. Uh-oh. Now stop. Yes. What, do you, what did we learn here? We that learned. the father knew that this was it? Or knew the line was coming from him? Or... No. Is it that the father wanted more love from Jeff than he was giving because of his wife? And so it was like a weird tension there? Or what's what's the conclusion you reach from, from that From the line? suicide note? Yeah. Oh, I, th- I think that he's he's writing it to the blue scorpion because he saw that the bullet oh. had Jeff written on it. And he's like, I'm not going to kill my son, Jeff. Oh, so wait, he no. killed himself. Wait, so the oh, I didn't understand this at all. The father had two bullets? He had an Otis and a Jeff bullet? I think that's what happened. Oh, I never thought of it that way. Although we'll get into that in a little bit. Okay. And near the end. That okay. may not, I'm, I'm starting to think about it, may not track now. I think it might be one per customer. I think but, it's one per customer. Yeah. But, but still, conceptually, that probably makes sense that he's talking about his son. Yeah. 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 I don't think he did it like in a spiteful way. His dad's a hippie. Right. He played with the Grateful Dead for crying out loud. But what if you found out that like at the end of the episode, he was actually named Otis Jr. and that Jeff is a nickname? Oh, Do you think no. they make it a stronger episode? I don't know. Okay. Anyways, go on. He's more than that. So back at Dad's house, the gun guy calls again. And he's like, don't call anymore. I don't want to sell it. I love this gun. And he lies down, and he's got the blue scorpion on the couch with him. And then he just kind of has a big montage of dry firing it into the air, walking around the house, pretending to shoot it like kind of like the episode of The Simpsons when Homer got a gun. <laughs> he's just, using it to open his beer and exactly. stuff. Exactly. <laughs> he's quoting Dirty Harry. Yeah, know? yeah. He does that speech. And then he hears something outside. And it's a guy kind of digging around in a trash can. And then Jeff looks out the window and he aims the gun at him. Looks kind of conflicted. Yeah. Well, then he gets freaked out because he sees his own reflection in the window. Mm-hmm. He's like, what, what have I become? I'm not a gun thing. guy. Yeah. But maybe I am a gun guy. Oh. Now he's in the car looking at Ann's house like Andy Dufresne. A little Shawshank Redemption action there. Uh, and he pulls out the blue scorpion and kind of puts it on the dash. And he sees the other Jeff in the window. And then suddenly the car window smashed by a guy, and they, the guys are fighting for a while. And it's like, what is going on here? And it keeps cutting to the gun pointed. Easy, good drama. You know that gun's going to go off. The Who's gun is going to go off. And then the blue scorpion is on the. It goes off by itself, and the bad guy falls onto the ground, even though the gun is still pointing at the Jeff. It seemed that way. It's a confusing shot because it's kind of rainy outside, and I looked. I watched it twice. And I, this is, I feel very dumb, but I could not tell if the window was broken or if it was just water droplets on the window. Like if there's something supernatural happening, hmm. but whatever. I don't know. I don't know. So the other Jeff, that, that, that guy's gone. And the cops come. We, uh, they're our friends in this episode. And they yell, get on the ground. And he drops the gun. And then we learn the shooting victim was the home invader. And he apparently decided to move on to cars, which whatever. And the guy's name? Well, he said, Barrett's last name. And then our Jeff says, first name's Jeff. He's like, oh, did you know the guy? Yeah. Dun, dun, dun. Phew. One per customer, Jeff. So then we see a, a newspaper clip as a local professor declared hero after capturing serial burglar. Capturing? A weird take on what happened. Wh- okay. And then, yeah, uh, his wife gives him everything in the divorce because oh, she's so wait. happy about it. I the, I did write down some of the stuff from the story because yeah. there was a little oh, story please. written there. Um, 
local professor of anthropology, Jeffrey Stork, was declared a hero yesterday after helping the authorities capture an elusive burglar who'd been targeting a Rochester suburb for weeks with a string of hot prowl home invasions. And then another few paragraphs later says, he was a good guy with a gun in the right place at the right time, police office Stewart said. <laughs> Does it really say office? Yeah. That's fun. But that good guy with a gun, you know, I mean, that's certainly a narrative that uh, hardcore Second Amendment people push. Yeah. The first time you saw that T-shirt where it's a guy with mm-hmm. bear arms uh, and it said, like, protect the Second Amendment, right. did you think that was funny or... No, I would say it's on par with like FBI f- female body inspector. Yeah, it's probably like the same. Mm, I think it's one notch above that. But you think so? I was actually. It's weird. I was just thinking about the Second Amendment. You know what's weird? Hmm. It's weird that with the Second Amendment, oh, <laughs> what's that stupid joke again? You are a comedian. <laughs> Thank you. Anyways, but then he also gets a promotion at it's his a, job it's a and weird, all this it stuff. It's like, what's like a, happening? It feels like a montage. Yeah, because it feels like a parody now. Yeah, because like, I don't like, know what's happening. The attorney's like, Anne so it was happy that you protected her, and she's made a bunch of concessions to show her gratitude. She hugs him. The world's never been happier that it's he, like he shot Charles Manson. Yeah, it's just like a Holmberg. Yeah, he gets a, a, a hot a string of hot prowl home invasions. Uh, yeah, he's offered the chair of the department of his university, and then he goes to ship the gun off. And he changes his mind and decides, I'm just going to throw it into this lake yeah. instead. And he chucks it probably a good 15 feet. Yeah, that's tough. And then, uh, then we see some kids with fishing poles, and then one runs down the shore a bit and finds the blue scorpion. The other kid finds a bullet and says, hey, my name's on it. And the other kid doesn't see it. He just sees a bullet. So they load it, start playing with it. Like they read the brand or rights to the other one, and then they're like, that's so cool. It pans back. We don't hear a gunshot yet. Whoa, ah, ah, so ah. did you think that the kid was going to fish it out because they're f- fishing? Well, he's going to catch the scorpion? Well, the fact that it was like thrown into the water, it seems... I guess I guess so. it does have some like limited teleportation powers because it did bl- blip itself over to a bed. Was this also the same beach as Nightmare at 3,000 Feet? <laughs> oh, jeez. Like, honestly, seriously, is it? Like, physically, like that location? I think so. I mean, I think they're oh. like hinting at the larger Twilight Zone universe at this point, but there were like islands not too far away that I could see... It Wait, like you, it was like you think that those thing. people were stranded on a beach where no, it's within I don't think so. I'm just saying that beach kids? I think looked a lot like the other beach. Oh, that's all. I'm, I'm just asking questions. I'm just asking. And questions. then it had land. Next I'm just to asking water. questions. <laughs> These are very smart questions. Thank you. Yeah. So that's the. Uh, oh, and then uh, uh, Jordan Peele says, uh, "As long as objects are cherished more than lives, mm-hmm. tragedy will forever be manufactured mm-hmm. in the Twilight Zone." Yeah. I I actually like this episode. I think it's fine. It feels to me a lot like an old Twilight Zone episode. I think we're just talking Mm -hmm. about like they got to get away from like these big current societal moral issues. But did they? I think they did. Yeah. It's not so much about like aren't guns dangerous. It's guns are sexy. It's it's whatever else the episode is about fathers or about objects falling in love with objects i guess mm-hmm. which feels like an old twilight zoney type of thing i think it, it's falling in love with objects but about guns in particular like it, there's something beguiling about the power well, that, i don't think so because that lady you. was talking about her shoes talking and all that stuff right but i think that was kind of an inroad to showing his relationship with the gun but i think that it's all about just how guns you get a, like people get obsessed with them hmm I think it's I think it's broader than that, ma'am. I yeah. gotta disagree. I do like haunted objects, though. Right, I it think... is just a haunted object episode, and it it feels a little bit like an old Twilight Zone episode of just like finishing it and being like, "What was that about? What's mm-hmm. the the point of this thing here?" It like, almost seems like if you were to have very broad outline for a most unusual camera in this one, and then tell somebody. Like, give these outlines to someone who's not familiar with the Twilight Zone at all and say, which one is from the 60s and which one was, like, a more contemporary version. I think that people would assume, and this is just a hypothetical I'm building up here, that the 60s would have a gun and then it has been smoothed over to be a camera now. Mm, except that cameras don't exist and it'd just be a most unusual phone. A most unusual most phone. Most unusual Google Pixel 3. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, I take it but I, I hear what you're saying. Do you think any part of it was about, like, 
focusing too much on the tangible parts of his dad's life and like not wanting to let go of those objects when it's like ultimately that doesn't matter, man. They didn't talk about who his dad was enough. They no. too focused too much on what he, he had. He, yeah, he hung out with Billy Joel. Or I think that it, that would have been the case if it had been like a most unusual bass guitar. But right. I think the fact that it is a gun mm-hmm. speaks volumes, especially knowing what we know about the current trajectory of this rebooted Twilight Zone, where it is about tanking kind of hot button issues. I think yeah. it's no accident that it is a, the Blue Scorpion is a gun. Right, but this Blue Scorpion did have an accident by shooting off several times. I think it was on episode. purpose. Oh, it was. This gun does kill people. I hope those kids just sell it immediately and make a lot of money, and then that's what the next episode's about, is just rich kids with money. Mm-hmm. And then they donate it to the president kid because they want those free video games. Yeah. I agree. Blue Scorpion, ladies Blue and Scorpion. Um, I, uh, Maybe this is high now, reading back through this. I gave it a seven. Yeah, I gave it a six. Okay. All right. It's another like another in a long string of Twilight Zones where it's like the performances are fine. I like the cast a lot. I think it's directed well. Yeah. I think it's an interesting conceit. But I think it just gets bogged down by just kind of this meandering direction where, like, the fact that it, there is no, like, what are you trying to say here? You know? Yeah. I don't know if too many of the other episodes this season have fallen into that camp. It's a little bit yeah. like, we get what you're trying to say yeah, here in the, the other episodes, yeah, know, yeah. which I'd prefer at a certain point. Yeah. I guess something with a little more, little more mystery around it, like this one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think you might like the next episode if you like mystery. I saw just the first frame. Uh-huh. Is Seth Rogen in it? He is. That's fun. Yeah. I, I'm happy to see Seth Rogen. It's about People abortion. Oh, is it really? No, I don't know. <laughs> Jesus. Okay. Hey, everybody. Blue Scorpion. Thanks for watching and listening to this episode. If you're watching it on YouTube, uh, you can subscribe to the audio version and go back to the full archives of our podcast and listen to the old good ones. <laughs> uh, but until next time, Twilight Island. Bye, bye, bye.